All right, this is Dr. Mark Barkey. This is for AEM 535 Applied Finite Element Analysis. We're going to continue on with our look at our Schedule 80 pipe. And this is kind of a redo of uh, the Abacus tutorial video I've made a few years back. I'm going to make a couple changes uh, for this version of it, but it should be fine. Now, one thing I did is I took my input file that we created in the HyperMesh tutorial video and put it in my temp folder. Now my temp folder is on drive D. Your temp folder may be somewhere else for Abacus, but that's where it needs to be. Uh, it can be somewhere else, but that's where Abacus will be uh, looking for it for the default. So I'm going to start up our Abacus. And as a reminder, this is the 2022 version of Abacus. Now sometimes there's changes. Sometimes there's, there's little changes, big changes, but... Uh, going to use the 2022. If there's big changes later, I'll make a new video later. But here we are. We're going to start up with Abacus CAE. And uh, it'll take a moment uh, to start up here. So it says 44 out of 50 licenses remain available. So we're using our Teaching Edition server. And uh, it pops up with this first window. I'm just going to X out of that. And I'm going to maximize my window here. So this is what Abacus starts off with. Uh, it may be a little more compressed. If you want this to be smaller, you can drag this over a little bit. And it comes up with model number one, which is kind of a blank model. And I'll just kind of close that one up. I haven't deleted it, but I closed it up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to import the input file that HyperMesh made. Now remember, the input file was only nodes and elements. So file, import. Model, and I need to change this instead of CAE. I need to change it to INP. Here's the one that I made. The pipe version two bring this in. I'm assuming that this does not exceed the limits of the teaching edition of Abacus. Rotate it around. Kind of see it in space. Looks pretty nice. Remember, we got rid of that seam and. Let's see, let's rotate it around, and we're going to do a couple things to this. Right now, all it is is the nodes and elements, and we need to turn this into something that Abacus knows what to do with. So we're going to go to our module list, and we have part and property. This is really kind of our part. I'm going to go down to property. I'm going to put in material properties for our pipe. Now let me get back here. Now I've saved this. I'm just going to hit new. And we're using the pounds, inches, and second unit system for this particular model. I don't often like to use this unit system. I prefer millimeters and newtons. But I do want to show what happens when you use this kind of unit system so that we kind of cover both. So this example will we'll kind of cover that aspect. Um, in the U.S., most of us are more familiar with these um, kind of English standard units. Than we are with the SI system. As an engineer, though, you'll be very familiar with the SI system as well. So let's do this one in pounds and inches. And so our mesh that we made, our model, we said was 36 inches long. And the, uh, the OD was 24 inches. And the wall thickness, this right, was 0.125 inches according to that pipe table. Now, for material properties, I'm going to do a linear elastic finite element analysis. And so all I need to do is enter linear elastic, finite, uh, linear elastic material properties. And I'm going to make this pipe out of steel. And the steel has a modulus of 30 million PSI. Now, since I'm going to use the pound and inches system, I'm already set with my dimensions as inches. I need to use my force as pounds. All the other units are derived from that. So my stress is going to be pounds per square inch. So anything I have that has stress units needs to be entered in pounds per square inch. And when my stresses show up on the screen, they need to be interpreted as pounds per square inch, PSI. 
So I need my modulus of elasticity. I need my Poisson's ratio too. Uh, just as a reminder, in case it's been a little while, the modulus of elasticity, or Young's modulus, as Abacus calls it, is the slope of the stress-strain curve in its linear portion. So we're below the proportional limit stress, where this starts to maybe not be a straight line anymore. And we're definitely below the yield stress, where we start to have permanent deformation. This might be the yield stress right here. And so the modulus of elasticity is the slope of the stress-strain curve in this portion. Now, if you do a tension test on materials, and I have some material properties data that you can look at and analyze, this really is a very straight line. So E, at least for steel anyway, uh, 30 million PSI. Some other metals, it might look a little curvy, but it's a straight line assumption here. And then Poisson's ratio is the ratio of the diametral to the axial strain of the tension test, the negative sign thrown in. So if you're in a tension test, pull on it, you develop some axial strain, and you develop some transverse or diametral strain. And so Poisson's ratio is defined as the negative, the transverse strain divided by the axial strain. And for the steel that we're going to use, 0.3 is a pretty common number, so we'll use 0.3. Yours might be 0.25 or what have you, but let's stick with these for now so we can get the same results. So there's a few things that we're going to do in this analysis. So let's, let's make a little list. I kind of like to do this at the beginning of my videos about what things we're going to learn. Um, we're going to learn about boundary conditions. We're going to learn how... Um, over constraint can lead to unusual stresses. You know, relax the over constraint. And we're going to use um, an XYZ model, uh, but we're also going to use a cylindrical coordinate system model. So an R theta Z model. We're going to look at different coordinate systems. You have. We're going to learn how to apply the boundary conditions. We're going to learn how to apply a pressure load similar to homework zero. But then we're also going to put an internal pressure on the pipe. We're going to test out and see if we get a nice uniform stress and axial tension. And then we're going to take and put an internal pressure. Um, <clears throat> for the axial loading, we're going to compare our displacements, what we get from mechanics of materials. Mechanics of materials, you know, we have this relation sigma is equal to E uh, epsilon, just the equation of a straight line, Hooke's Law equation. We can replace the stress with F over A, and we can replace the strain, the engineering strain, with the change in length divided by the original length. We can solve for the change in length that's going to be equal to FL over AE. We're going to do that calculation by hand and compare it to our finite element results after we've got our good boundary conditions. And in addition to that, we're going to take a look at this pipe with internal pressure. We're not going to put any pressure on the, the end. Uh, I guess we could in a, in a combined step, but we're going to take a look at internal pressure. And we're going to calculate the hoop stress using finite elements and mechanics materials. Now remember the hoop stress, um, that's the big one that uses the formula PR over T, where R is actually the inside radius and T is the wall thickness. We're going to see how well that does. Now this particular formula is good when we have a T over R of less than or equal to 0.1. So we're going to see if we're in that range of 0.1 and, and see what our hoop stress calculation is compared to the, the finite element mesh. All right, so those are some of the things that we're going to do and learn in this particular analysis. All right, so let's go back to our abacus window. And here we have this here. So we said we need to put our 
uh, material properties in. Let's just change the name of this to steel. Do whatever you'd like. You can edit the description if you want. There's lots of different behaviors. We're going to go mechanical elastic behavior with a Young's modulus or modulus of elasticity, as we talked about, a 30 million. So 30, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. I have to enter that in PSI. And then I put 0.3 for my Poisson's ratio. Now, we can make temperature dependent data, we can look at plasticity, we can put in conductivity, we can put in electromechanical, uh, electromagnetic properties, do other things. So this is all we need for this analysis. Now, obviously, you can't do uh, any elastic analysis if you only put in elastic material properties. Abacus is very um, deep in its breadth on material behavior. That's one of the nice features about Abacus is you can do a lot of interesting material things. I can only do what you put in, but this is good for, for us right now. We'll do more sophisticated analyses later in the semester. So I'm going to hit OK, and now I've made that material property. Now the next thing I want to do is I'm going to go continue down, and I want to create a section. And the section here, uh, what this means is what is your section properties? What are they? If you're a beam section, then we need to know what the moment of inertia is. If you're a shell section, then we may need to know what the thickness of the shell is. And you can click on some of these things and see what all the different sub-options are. This is a solid element model, so we're going to do a solid for our category. And we'll do composites later, but there's generalized places. We're going to do homogeneous. Call the name of the section, section 1, and that, that is perfectly fine. We're going to hit continue. We're going to choose the material, a steel, it kind of popped that up with a default. If we want to choose a different one, if we have aluminum in here, we can choose aluminum and create a new material if we would like and hit OK. Now just because we've created the section doesn't mean that we've assigned it to anything yet, so that's the next step. So we're going to go over here to Assign Section, and we have by angle, feature edge, topology, or individually. I'm going to use individually. It says select the regions to be assigned. So I'm going to take, I'm going to click, it's a left click, just make a big box around this model. See how it's all highlighted. I'm going to hit done. And I'm going to give it section one properties. Okay. See how it kind of changed the color. Now, I don't have another section to assign. So I'm just going to click out of X out of this. And you can go create a composite layup and do these other things for the for this but that's all we need to do here now notice uh, when I imported this model now we're working in this space and model one is just the empty thing so at this point I'm just going to get rid of this one it's just an empty model I don't want it cluttering things up so I'm just going to get rid of it so let's see what we need to do next now if we go over here to property there's assembly uh, we don't need to make an assembly. We're good here. An assembly would be if I have five components, five parts. I want to bring those five parts and instance them into the assembly. That means I want part number one to be at this location, part number three to be at that location, and, and make that assembly. That's what I would do in the assembly. I don't need to do that here since we've just got a very simple model. And most of the time in this class, we're going to work with simple models because we're investigating features of the code and, and making sure we get good results. But on the job, you may have a big finite element assembly that you need to deal with. <clears throat> so the next thing then, I'm going to go to the step module. We go over here to the left side and click on this plus button. We can see the steps. Now inside the step is where we specify our loads that are going on and our boundary conditions. And think of this in, um, as a sequential operation. If you have 10 steps, step number one may be applying your boundary condition. Step number, well, that's the initial step. Step number one may be uh, applying the load in the axial direction. Step number two may be applying a pressure load. Step number three may be having both of them at the same time. You know, what do you do in order and, and how that works out? depends on how you sequence this. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some initial boundary conditions in this model. So 
that would happen in our load uh, module over here. Interaction would hit would be things like contact and whatnot. Um, load is for loads and boundary conditions. It's kind of it seems kind of funny that boundary conditions would be in the load module, but that's what they mean when they use it in Abacus. So we can create uh, a load, or we can create a boundary condition, or we can go over here and go to create. And I'm going to create a boundary condition BC1. That's a fine name. It's going to be in step initial. It's going to be mechanical boundary condition. And we have all these different options. I'm going to specify the displacement option or the rotation option and continue. Now it says select the regions for the boundary condition individually. So I can go through here and I can select all these nodes one at a time. Or if I choose by angle, and uh, it'll kind of highlight that entire feature edge. So it's really great. It's really handy to do this. So I'm going to select that, and I'm going to hit Done. And right now, I'm going to over-constrain this. We're going to take a look at our results. I'm going to over-constrain it, so I'm going to apply boundary conditions in the X, Y, and Z condition in the global coordinate system. So the, the X, Y, and Z, it's like they're completely clamped down can't move at all x y and z directions now u r u one and u r one u r two u r three those are the nodal rotations solid elements cannot have nodal rotations you can't turn the, the the node into the element itself if you had a shell element then you could have nodal rotation you can put these as zero if you want it's going to ignore them because they're solid elements so I'm just going to leave them alone I'm going to hit OK now I'm going to create um, a step, so I can go back here to the step, or I can right-click over here and create a step. And the new step is going to be after the initial step. It's going to be step one. It's going to be a general static analysis. So you do heat transfer, and you look through all these different things. The most common thing is the default uh, that people do, so it kind of highlights that. And I'm going to hit continue. And uh, as we talked about, the time period is going to be one. We had time-dependent material properties or heat transfer things. Then we would want to change this time period to be something else, maybe. Uh, one is fine for our purposes. We're going to use automatic incrementation because it's a linear elastic analysis. It's going to be really easy if, unless we have a big problem. It should be solved right away. And then uh, I'm not going to touch any of this other stuff on other. I'm just going to hit OK. So now I have a step one. And I'm going to create a load. So we go back here to our load module, or we can create a load over here by right clicking. I'm going to rotate this around so I can see the other side of this model. I'm going to go over here and create a pressure load called load one. It's a mechanical load. See the other options we have here hit continue and I'm going to go by angle so I'm going to create that load on that particular surface. I'll hit done. It's going to be a uniform distribution and the magnitude I'm going to put a thousand psi tension on it so I need minus 1000. I'm going to do an, a ramp amplitude so over time it'll ramp from zero to minus 1000 at the end of one second and I'm going to hit OK and my arrows are pointing outward from this object. So that's how I want it to be if I want the pipe to be in tension. All right, so uh, we've applied our loads or boundary conditions. We'll come down here. Mesh, we're not going to worry about optimization, job, and so forth. I do want to make some adjustments at this point to my field output request. And so my field output request is in step one. That's my steps. Step one is where I applied the load. So I'm going to double click on that and open up this dialog box. And there's a lot of different things in here. Um, we've seen this previously. This is pre-selected defaults. And that is a fine uh, thing to have. Stresses, strains, displacements, forces, rotations, contact, and so forth. Uh, but if I only um, have this 
it's only going to give me the output at the end of the job at one second. I really want to see more than that. I want to see the behavior of the model as it's loaded up. So I'm going to change this to every uh, X units of time in over one second. If I do 0 0.02, I believe that'll give me 50 increments, 50 calculations of the stress state and the displacements and everything else asked for at those uh, in this model. So we'll be able to see this thing evolve. So that's the one thing I'm going to change here. And I'm going to hit OK. All right, now we're getting close. Uh, we're going to go to the job menu, or we can come down here and create a job. Now, Abacus will always start off at the beginning of the day, assuming you want to call your first job, job one. Maybe that's not what you want to do. Maybe you want to change it to something else. Maybe those files already exist, and you don't want to overwrite those files. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call this pipe job one. The source is going to be the model, and this is the model that we're using. You can have multiple models in your file. Then I'm going to continue, hit OK. Now, if we expand this, we'll see this job named right here. We have not yet submitted the job. It's still uh, just kind of sitting there waiting to be submitted. Before I go any further, though, I'm going to save my file because I've done a lot of work and I would hate for this thing to crash. So I'm going to save this in my temp folder as a CAE file. Like I said, I like to put the date in here. Call this, uh, well, it's a CAE file. So the hypermesh file, and we call this version 2. So I'm just going to type that in there. It's going to save it as a CAE. Now we have that thing saved. All right, fingers crossed I haven't left anything out. I'm going to right-click on this, and I'm going to hit Submit. And it's thinking about it, and it says the job has been submitted for analysis. Now, I will say on this computer, I have had the same issue that a lot of students have had, where you submit the job, and it looks like it's never going to stop. Uh, and that's a problem with Abacus. It's not a problem with um, your computer. I'm going to go to the Task Manager, and this job may have already finished. So I'm going to check my CPU. I'm going to check my processes. stuff in here. Let's see if we can find I'm sure what's called simula. Yeah. So the licensing, it's doing that. So all of these uh, processes have kind of um, gone down back down to zero CPU. I don't see anything with real any real high CPU at the moment. My screen recording software. It's the only thing. All right, so I think this job is done. We're going to have to go and find out. So if we go to our temp folder and we sort by date modified, remember we call this pipe dash job one. So let's open this up um, and let's look at it. Okay, it says a socket error, kit address info failed. Checked it out and it did it, it ran standard.exe and it actually finished it. Uh, it says, warning, interactive messaging has been requested for this analysis run, but initialization of the messaging system has failed. Therefore, no messages will be sent to Abacus CAE for this phase of the analysis. And it says, job completed. All right, so in previous versions of Abacus, I didn't have this problem. I don't know why I got this problem now used to be you could come over here and select monitor be able to see what was going on apparently that's not going to work on this computer maybe it's going to work for years i don't know since this job is done though i can go over here and i can click right click and, and load the results um, 
So, so you, you know, the, the calculation part of the program is doing what it's supposed to, but for some reason, the CAE isn't uh, behaving properly to let you know that the job is done. So I'm going to go over here and plot the stress contour. Now, this is the von Mises stress. Um, if I want the stress in the axial direction, that would be the 3-3 three, three stress. So let's see. And I'm going to animate it by clicking the Animate Time History. And you see, uh, because I did 0 .2, 0 0.02 time increments, it has a lot of things going on, um, a lot of frames that we have here. If we want to see the frames, we can go over to the Output Database. Uh, let's see, steps, and here are the various frames, 0 through 29 and 30 through 50. Now, let's rotate this around. On this right side is where we constrain the pipe. Now, ideally, if we put 1,000 PSI on the end of the pipe, and we would have a thousand psi in tension throughout the entire length of this pipe just a straight piece of pipe but because of the way we constrained it fixing it on all these nodes we're inducing some spurious stresses stresses that i don't think i want in my pipe now if you do a, a test on a pipe and you weld it to some big giant heavy steel plate and you really do fix it Maybe that is the right stress. But what I'm trying to model is a free section of pipe. It might be in a long pipe run where it's completely free to expand in its axial direction if it wants to. If that's what I'm trying to model. Then the way I've constrained this is not appropriate. Let's get to the end. All right, so you see these stresses, and it looks like on that end, it's varying from the green, 650 PSI to the red, which is maybe 1,200 PSI. Equilibrium still has to be maintained, so if the stresses are higher in one spot, it's going to be lower in the other spot. If I want to see the values, what I can do is uh, go to Tools, Query, the Node, Probe Values, S33 stress, and I'm going to, oh, it's got elements here, changes the node. Go with 377, I'm going to go to this 376. So you see the, the exact values or the calculated values at the nodes for those stresses in the 33 three direction. If I go over here, I get my 1,000, pretty much. PSI, which is what I applied, which is what I expect. And a little bit less here. As we go down, it gets a little bit weirder to approach this boundary condition. So one of the things I want you to get out of finite element analysis is artificial over-constraint can cause spurious stresses near your boundary condition. If you don't want those, if you're not trying to model that, then we're going to have to do something to make this um, not have that weird behavior there, to model it more appropriately. I want to know if I want to save the probe values. I'm going to say no. The other thing I'll point out is that St. Venant's principle says if you go away from where the boundary conditions are, you'll get a more uniform distribution. So out here, it looks pretty nice. So if we cut this part off, well, maybe we can say this part of our model is behaving the way that we want. Maybe we just don't need to pay attention to this side. We can do better, though, so better. All right, I'm going to take a quick pause. It'll probably be nothing for you, but I'm going to pause for just a moment. Uh, get set up for the next part of this. All right, so we'll continue on. Now, we're currently in the Results tab. We're going to move over to the Model tab. And um, you see we have the name of this. I'm going to right-click, and I'm going to copy this model. 
We're going to edit the copy. And I'm going to put a little rotation in here to indicate that we're going to use a cylindrical coordinate system. Everything else is the same. So I'm going to copy that and I'll put it here. Now, uh, the way that this orders this is alphabetically, so I want to make sure I work in the right one. So I'm going to open up this one. And I'm going to get back. I'm just going to double click on this model. It'll get rid of this results screen right here. There we go. Clicked on parts. So everything else is the same, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to try to make a new coordinate system, a cylindrical coordinate system. Okay, so my step that I'm going to put here, I am going to, let's see, I want to do this, my boundary condition, I'm going to edit the boundary condition. And I'm going to change from my global coordinate system. I'm going to create a coordinate system. Now we need to kind of keep track of this name. So so it's not confused too confusing. I put my initials in there. I'm going to put cylindrical. And I'm going to select a cylindrical coordinate system. And hit continue. Okay, so it says, what is the origin point of our coordinate system? This is a point on your model. You can select it. Remember, 0, 0, 0 is the one in. So I'm just going to hit enter. Do that default. Uh, select a point to be on the R axis, so I'm going to go 1, 0, 0, enter, um, and select a point to be in the R theta plane, 0, 1, 0, and it'll keep doing this until you just cancel this out. So I created my coordinate system, but it's going to keep thinking you want to do this forever, but I don't. So I'm going to hit cancel. If you're not careful, you could end up creating like 10 coordinate systems before you figure out you got to hit cancel. I'm going to do that. And, and now I created that coordinate system, but my coordinate system for my boundary conditions is still assuming that it is in the global system. So I'm going to click on this little arrow that says edit. Over here, it says select a coordinate system. And I'm going to go over here to my coordinate system list. And I'm going to choose this one. Now, to allow for free Poisson contraction while I'm in tension, I do not want to constrain the radial direction. Now, in XYZ, 1 represents x, 2 represents y, 3 represents z. In a cylindrical coordinate system, 1, 2, and 3 represents r, theta, and z. So I want to leave the box checked on theta and z. I don't want this thing to spin. I don't want this thing at this edge to get longer. But I want it to freely move in the r direction. So I'm going to take that one off, and I'm going to hit OK. Let's just check to make sure this propagated properly. It says it's a propagated. Open that up, and yeah, it looks like it propagated properly into the next step. All right, so this still says submitted, um, even though the thing finished. So I'm going to create pipe dash job. Two. based on this model, 
and hit continue. All the defaults are fine. And remember, we already have uh, the field output requests occurring every 0.02 seconds for a total job time of one second. Let me bring up my thing here. So let's go ahead and submit it. I'll try to bring up my task manager quick. Let's see where it is. And we'll take a look at the CPU. Okay, so this is the preprocessor for Abacus using some CPU. Uh, now the main, it's doing some stuff here. You can switch over to performance. CPU time is kind of rising up. A lot of times you can tell when a job is done when the CPU time kind of tapers down. And that's what we're going to have to do if this isn't working properly uh, through here. Hopefully they'll get that fixed either in an interim release or the next release. Now you can open a results file partially through your analysis. It um, just won't be the last one. Okay, so you see my, my CPU has kind of dropped down. We go into our window for temp. Bring that over here. Sort by date modified. And pipe dash job two dot log if I open it up okay so it's completed no advocacy CAE doesn't know it's completed right. that's unfortunate that it's doing that and it may not be that way on every computer so um, we'll see so right click and we're gonna look at the results now I have two output databases ODB stands for output database And let's animate this. And now look at that. So this is the fixed end over here. And, and we're really getting an extremely uniform axial stress distribution. So by relaxing that constraint, we get a more realistic idea of what's going on in this particular analysis. Now this is the von Mises stress. Um, let's change these. We go here. S stands for stress. Go uh, S11. Go S22. Very small numbers. S11 should have been very small numbers too. 10 to the minus 12. That's like mach machine precision. So we're not getting any stresses in the x and y direction. Go S33, we should be ramping up to 1,000. Let's get to the final frame. Click it over. So we see uh, we're in the red. Well, the red is in between this range, but let's go to Tools, Query, uh, Probe Values, Node, any of these nodes, and we get 1,000. Even where we have down on the end where we got the boundary condition get a thousand psi so we're getting the uniform stress distribution that we think we ought to all right now let's do something else we mentioned that we wanted to calculate uh, the deformation of the pipe using mechanics and materials and compare it to calculation that abacus, abacus tells us now the the stress in the pipe we specified it to be a thousand psi so you know the fact that we got a thousand psi just means that we applied our boundary conditions properly. Let's get out of this, and I'm going to change this from uh, S33. I'm going to change this to U for displacement, and right now it's the displacement magnitude. So you know the magnitude of the vector is the square root of the sum of the squares. I don't want to compare this to the magnitude because the Poisson's contraction. I want to compare this to the U3 displacement. Okay, so that changes things just a little bit. Now, the other thing I want to mention about uh, finite elements and 
probably seen this already. Uh, the the deformed animation is scaled so that you can visibly see the deformation. This is not a one-to-one -one scale on deformation. 24-inch pipe is not going to deform this much under 1,000 PSI. But you can, you can change that deformed scale through some of our options. And we'll get to that in some subsequent videos. All right, let's go to our last video. Our, our last uh, frame, rather, sorry. And uh, we'll close this out. Let's, let's uh, tools, query, probe values. And I'm going to go from the nodes. I'm going to select a node that is on the end of the pipe. Okay, all those that I select, let me write this down. I'll write it down in a second. It's 0 0.0012. The units of that are in inches. All right, let's do a calculation by hand. Okay, FEA 0 0.0012 inches. Now we talked about this formula that delta L is equal to F L over A B, or a linear elastic bar. And if we group the F and the A together, that's the stress. So that's our 1,000 PSI that we put into our model. So the length of this was 36 inches. And the modulus of elasticity was uh, 30 million PSI. So let's see what I get when I do that particular calculation. I get 0 0.002. So my finite element analysis, that's zero error. Finite element analysis is really pretty good calculating displacements, particularly when you get your boundary conditions um, the way that you want them to. Now, if we use our over-constrained mesh, we might not have gotten 0 0.0012 inches. It might have been pretty close, but, but maybe not. I do need to emphasize we're using the displacement in the three direction. All right, so that checks out. So that's that's nice. So let me cancel this out. I'm going to hit no on that. Close this out. We have a little bit more we want to do to this. What we're going to do next is we're going to put an internal pressure onto this pipe instead of the axial force. And then we're going to uh, see what the stresses look like in comparison to mechanics and materials. Remember, a pressure vessel in the hoop direction is PR over T. Let me wrote that down. All right, so let's go back to our models, and we have two two models here. Uh, that's our current one, and uh, let's copy this one. I like those boundary conditions. And we did the cylindrical coordinate system, and then now we're going to go uh, internal pressure. on our part it'll get us into that screen same material same everything now uh, we're going to get into our step let's get rid of or maybe we can just edit this load instead of being on surface one we're going to edit that region No, it's not going to let us do that. So I'll tell you what, what we're going to do is let's create a new load. Create a pressure called load 2. And uh, it says eligible surfaces. I guess, let's see, select and viewport by angle. We're going to select the interior of the pipe. We're going to call that surface 2. 
Now this time we're going to put a thousand PSI, but we're going to put it so that it's pushing into the surface. Then we're going to hit OK. And uh, now we're going to get rid of this load. And let's see. What's the best way to do that? Go to our load manager. We're just going to delete load number one. So now all we have is the interior pressure load. Let's kind of get in. Okay, so that looks real nice. Now notice there's no axial load. So this would be the case of um, a pipe that is uh, like open-ended or has something flowing in it. That there, it's not like a pressure vessel, but it's, it's a pipe. You want to model a pipe with the schedule, schedule 80, 24 inch. So I think that's all we need to do here. We'll find out in a moment. Now I'm going to create a new job. And let's call it like we've been doing it. Pipe job three. And again, we're going to submit it. We're going to look at our CPU and see what spikes. And uh, again, we'll be able to tell when it's when it's done, when my CPU kind of falls back down. So it's ramping up. It's figuring things out. It's doing our calculations, making that stiffness matrix, doing its matrix calculations that computers like to do. I have a fairly decent computer here. It's not the very latest anymore. It's a uh, Dell Precision 5820 uh, with a reasonable CPU. Of course, as soon as you buy a computer, you know, it gets outdated. Um, but we'll let it uh, do its thing here for a moment. Probably done. Let's get into our temp folder. There's the pipe3.log. Let's open that up. Okay, job completed. The other things that you don't see, um, there's the status file. You can open that up as well. Here's the status. And so that tells you how it's doing with its increments. So remember we had 50 increments because we're doing 0.02 uh, time units in between outputs. And so this, this will tell you what's going on. Now, if you have plasticity going on, then it may have 50 increments for your step um, in between one second. So there may be, you know, just for this thing, there may be equilibrium iterations and discontinuity iterations and all these different things happening. So it doesn't always look this nice, but this is a very easy, well-posed problem. So there's no particular issues. So it doesn't have to iterate a bunch of times. So that one's in there. The message file is also something you might want to look at. On my computer, it always thinks the message file is an Outlook file, and I, I can't really change that, at least not that I recall. So we're going to take a look at it with, um, well, I guess we can do it with Crimson Editor, but I, the icon looks like the little envelope. And we're going to actually come over here and take a look at the message file. Now, if there is a problem, then you want to search for errors in your message file. But for every little increment, it has some data that's coming out. And this is the summary. It took a, took 41.8 seconds user time. It took one second of system time in uh, uh, total CPU time, wall clock time, 43 seconds. All right. So, so that's just some other information that you would normally be able to see by monitoring this 
here, um, again, don't really understand what the problem is. I guess the data files here, message file, the log file, no, the log file didn't load in. Uh, but I guess if you look at the data file, you can see that it, it finished. So I don't know if it's a Windows thing or if it's an Abacus thing, but that's what's going on. All right, well, let's take a look at the results for the internal pressure. Oh, this is the von Mises stress. Let's animate this and let's kind of get a feel for what's going on. If you're not familiar with the von Mises stress, uh, you might review your mechanics materials. I will point you to a video that explains the von Mises stress. Um, but uh, you know, that's a good thing that an analyst should know. This is why we tend to use the von Mises stress. But we'll get to that. So behavior-wise, <clears throat> it looks pretty nice. It's just kind of animating here. And uh, kind of it's blowing up like a balloon, but, but we are putting internal pressure. And again, it's exaggerated. The radial deformation is free. So that's nice behavior. Um, we do have some, let's get to the last frame, we do have different stresses on the inside and outside of this. So that's kind of interesting by itself. Now let's take a look at the stress components. Instead of the MISI stress, let's look at the 1-1. One, one. Oh, that looks pretty crazy. That's in the X direction. Let's look at the 2-2 two, two stress. Again, that looks kind of wild. And let's look at the 3-3 three, three stress. Small stresses in the axial direction. Uh, the shear stresses, again, kind of crazy looking. Pretty much zero stress in the 1, 3, and probably it's going to be about zero in the 2, 3. All right. Well, what's going on here with these stress plots is that we are pl plotting stresses in the X, Y, and Z coordinate system. And uh, or I should say, however, the more natural coordinate system is really the cylindrical coordinate system. So we look at the hoop stress, which would be our sigma theta, and maybe we want to look at the radial stress, which would be uh, sigma r. All right, so if you're familiar with tensor transformations, if you've taken my elasticity class, we know that we can transform from one coordinate system to another in we can let our uh, let Abacus do all that work for us, but we have to tell it to do it. Let's see if I can remember how to get this to work. And, and I've tried this, but it's something that um, I just have to uh, play around with a little bit sometimes to remember how to, to do that. So uh, ODB coordinate systems. Let's see, the hoop stress would be the second stress if I use my cylindrical coordinate system. Um, okay, so I double clicked on that. We can see my cylindrical coordinate system. Remember how I named it. And um, let's go here. Uh, Let me pause the video till I can find this place again where where I just did this. Okay, I think I'm back on track. I had kind of a weird graphics glitch where the thing wasn't updating. Uh, but it looks like I'm okay with that. All right, so what I want to do is I want to show these stresses in a cylindrical coordinate system. And so let me let me pause this. Let me get to the last frame on frame 50. I'm going to go over here to results and options and I'm going to look at this tab called transformation. So I'm going to go a uh, nodal, well, a user specified transformation and it's going to be the cylindrical coordinate system. I'm going to hit apply. Uh, 
Uh, now let's take a look. The von Mises stress isn't going to change since it's invariant. But now let's take a look at our 2-2 stress. You see now we have a nice uniform stress distribution here. And then 3-3, uh, three, three, pretty much 0. And the 1-1 one, one is the radial stress. It's a small stress in, uh, you know, if you, if you notice, we apply a stress of 1,000 in compression on the inner surface, and it looks like we still get a little bit of stress on the outer surface. It's maybe well, a little bit more than that, minus 1,300. So let's fit this. Let's go back to our... 3-3, three, three, uh, excuse me, our 2-2 two, two stress, that's the hoop stress. Let's take a couple of values. So we're going to go um, tools, query, probe values at the nodes. Change this to nodes. And we're going to take a look at a node that's on the interior and a node that's on the exterior. Then we're going to use our mechanics materials calculation to see What's going on with that? So let me write this down. One zero zero five seven point eight, and then out here somewhere ninety two sixty point two seven. Okay, so. We want it on the same edge. 92, let's call it 9262. And then on the interior, 1056, 10056. All right, let me, let's go back to our sketch pad here and let's do the calculation. So you might remember from mechanics materials that the hoop stress is equal to P R over T. This is the inside radius and this is the wall thickness. Now sometimes people use a mean radius, but let's see what we get from this calculation and then we can kind of see what's going on. So we put a thousand PSI and our inside radius was ten point eight seven five. And our wall thickness was one point one two five. Well, not my calculator. And I get the number 9666.6. Now, one thing we ought to do is we should check, is this really a thin-walled pressure vessel? We're using the thin-walled pressure vessel equation. So let's calculate the ratio of the wall thickness to the inside radius and see what we get. So 1.125 over 10.875. I get 0 0.10344. Uh, let me make sure I have my uh, number right for my ID just in case. So 12 inches radius minus the 1.125, yeah, 10.875. So that's pretty close to 0.1. It's kind of the cutoff for a thin walled pressure vessel. It's a little bit high. So I'm not surprised that we're a little bit off. Uh, but the numbers that we got, and I wrote these down, it was 10.056 on the outside. It was 92.62. On the inside. Let's just average those two. Let's see what we get. Ninety-six fifty-nine. Now, one of the assumptions with mechanics and materials is that we have a uniform stress distribution through the wall thickness. As you get into thick-walled pressure vessel theory in like advanced mechanics and materials, you will notice that you do not have a constant um, hoop stress through the wall thickness. But we've taken the average and, and we're pretty close. So I, you know, I suspect that's what's going on here is that we're kind of on the edge of thin wall pressure vessel theory 
So the numbers are a little bit off, but even then, if you kind of take the average of those two, um, or maybe look at a mean radius instead of a, an inside radius, you'll probably get closer to this 9667 PSI. All right, well, I think that's enough for this one. Remember, as you do your analyses, that you should um, do what I do and then do something else. So, you know, whatever that something else is, just something to explore what you've got, um, something to, to check, something you find of interest in the code, and so forth.